Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Circle Opens, a podcast devoted to a chapter-by-chapter review of Stephen King's The Stand. Do you need an affordable source for Stephen King books, movies, collectibles, and more? Make sure to visit Secondhand Bookery at secondhandbookery.etsy.com. Listeners of this podcast can use the coupon code The Circle for 20% off their order anytime, and there's always free shipping to the United States. That's Secondhand Bookery at secondhandbookery.etsy.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sarah, and thank you for joining me this week on our journey through the stand. I hope everyone is doing well and, of course, staying safe and healthy. Since we have a bit of a longer chapter today, we are going to just jump right into it with a quick recap of chapter 70 and 71 from last week. In chapter 70, Trash Can Man finds a nuclear warhead at an army base in the desert and plans on taking it back to Flag in Vegas to atone for his sins in Indian Springs. In chapter 71, Flag sends out the eye to track down the four men coming from the free zone. He finds them sleeping near a campfire along with Kojak, who sees the eye and wakes Glenn with his growling. Kojak and Flag have a sort of a face-off before Flag disappears. He realizes Nadine was right and they are coming for him. But rather than feel threatened, Flag believes that this is the perfect way to quell any doubts that the people in the West may have of his leadership. He'll execute the men and Kojak and leave their heads on spikes for all to see and understand who is in charge. So chapter 72, we are back with our four, five heroes, Glenn, Stu, Ralph, Larry, and of course, the best boy there ever was, Kojak. They seem to be in decent spirits, lamenting the lack of food and the changes in their physical shape. Glenn says that he had never wanted to be in this good of shape, but he doesn't mind it. Glenn says that after 50 years of confirmed agnosticism, it seems to be my fate to follow an old black woman's god into the jaws of death. If that's my fate, then that's my fate. End of story. Glenn's arthritis is acting up, although Glenn tries to downplay the pain. Surely it's not as bad as it'll be in about six to seven years, but he's not thinking that far ahead. Stu asks him, you really think he's going to take us? And Glenn Bateman had said a peculiar thing. I will fear no evil. And that had been the end of the discussion. Larry has been keeping track of their journey with a milometer and a piece of paper. So far, they've been walking 12 days and have managed 362 miles. From Boulder to Vegas is 771 miles so they still had about 409 miles to go. Larry thinks they're making good time, but what's the hurry anyway? Flag is just going to kill them when they get there. But Ralph isn't so sure. Maybe they'll die, but it can't be that simple. Mother Abigail wouldn't send them to Vegas just to be murdered with nothing coming of it. Stu isn't so sure it was Mother Abigail who sent them. As they get ready to start their day of walking, The little rituals of the morning went on. They had been 12 days on the road. It seemed to Stu that the days would go on forever like this. Glenn, bitching good-naturedly about the food. Larry, noting their mileage on his dog-eared cheat sheet. The two cups of coffee. Someone burying yesterday's scut. Someone else burying the fire. It was routine. Good routine. You forgot what it was all leading to, and that was good. In the mornings, Fran seemed very distant to him. Very clear, but very distant, like a photograph kept in a locket. But in the evenings, when the dark had come in and the moon sailed the night, she seemed very close, almost close enough to touch, and that, of course, was where the ache lay. At times like this, his faith in Mother Abigail turned to bitter doubt, and he wanted to wake them all up and tell them it was a fool's errand, that they had taken up rubber lances to tilt at a lethal windmill, that they had better stop at the next town, get motorcycles, and go back, that they had better grab a little light and a little love while they still could, because a little was all Flag was going to allow them. That was all at night, of course, because in the morning it still seemed like the right thing to keep going. 
the four men start down I-70 again to begin their day's walk. It began to rain later that day, dampening the conversation. Larry thought about Harold Louder, whose corpse they had found two days earlier. There seemed to be an unspoken conspiracy among them not to talk about him, so Larry thought about the Wolfman instead. They had found him just east of the Eisenhower Tunnel. The traffic was badly jammed up there, and the stink of death had been sickly potent. The Wolfman had been half in and half out of an Austin. He was wearing peg jeans and a silk sequined western shirt. The corpses of several wolves lay around the Austin. The wolfman himself was half in and half out of the Austin's passenger seat, and a dead wolf lay on his chest. The wolfman's hands were wrapped around the wolf's neck, and the wolf's bloody muzzle was angled up to the wolfman's neck. Reconstructing, it seemed to all of them that a pack of wolves had come down out of the higher mountains, had spotted this lone man, and had attacked. The wolfman had had a gun. He had dropped several of them before retreating to the Austin. How long before hunger had forced him out of his refuge? Larry didn't know, didn't want to know, but he had seen how terribly thin the wolfman had been. A week, maybe. He had been going west, whoever he was, going to join the dark man, but Larry would not have wished such a dreadful dreadful fate on anyone. And Larry couldn't help but be curious as to why the wolves would have hung around so long to attack this man. Stu didn't know either. Larry found it to be a dreadful mystery. Whoever Wolfman had been, he'd had some balls on him, taking out a wolf while being killed by it. Going through the Eisenhower Tunnel had reminded Larry of the Lincoln Tunnel, except it hadn't been Rita's face haunting him. It had been the Wolfman's. Had the wolves been sent to kill him? It was a thought too unsettling to consider. They made their camp that night beyond Loma, very close to the Utah state line. Ralph tells them how it will get bad in Utah. There's a stretch of about a 100 miles without a town or a gas station. Not much water, either. Maybe that's where they would find out if God was really watching over them. After Ralph and Larry turn in for the night, Glenn finally tells Stu about Kojak waking him up the night before. He explains that Kojak never looked at Glenn once after Glenn woke up and told him to shush. Glenn had thought maybe it was wolves, but there was nothing. Stu suggests that Kojak picked up a scent, but Glenn says that after a while, he felt a presence too. It was like something was watching them. He could almost see it if he squinted the right way, and it felt like flag. Stu, being Stu, is silent for a moment before saying that it was probably nothing. But Glenn disagrees. What if Flag was watching them? What can they do about it? Nothing. Glenn knows that and it scares him shitless. The two fall silent for a while before Stu brings up Harold. Stu believes it was a waste. A waste of Susan and of Nick. A waste of Harold, too. The buzzards had worked him over pretty well but Harold still clutched the permacover notebook in one stiffening hand. The thirty-eight was jammed in his mouth like a grotesque lollipop, and although they hadn't buried Harold, Stu had removed the pistol. He had done it gently. Seeing how efficiently the dark man had destroyed Harold and how carelessly he had thrown him aside when his part was played out had made Stu hate Flag all the more. It made him feel like they were throwing themselves away in a witless circle of children's crusade, and while he felt they had to press on, Harold's corpse with the shattered leg haunted him, the way the frozen grimace of the wolfman haunted Larry. He had discovered he wanted to pay Flag back for Harold, as well as Nick and Susan, but he felt more and more sure that he would never get that chance. Glenn turns in for the night, and Stu can tell Glenn's arthritis is bothering him, Stu sits alone for a bit, contemplating how this might be the last summer he ever sees. When this one had begun, he had lived in Arnett, working on and off at a factory, hanging out with the men at Haps, Texaco. He was used to listening to them talk shit about the government, the economy, and hard times, but Stu supposed they didn't really know what real hard times were. After going to sleep, Stu dreamed that something came near their camp something that was keeping malevolent watch over them. 
It might have been a wolf with human understanding, or a crow, or a weasel creeping belly down through the scrub. Or it might have been some disembodied presence, a watching eye. I will fear no evil, he muttered in his dream. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, no evil. At last the dream faded, and he slept soundly. The next night they slept west of Harley Dome. Ralph went to bed that night thinking, We're in the west now. We're out of our ballpark and into his. He dreamed of a wolf with a single red eye that had come out of the Badlands to watch them. Go away, Ralph told it. Go away. We're not afraid. We're not afraid of you. On the afternoon of September 21st, they were past Sago. They were getting to the stretch where they would have very little access to water or food. Larry brings up Mother Abigail, how he thinks maybe she was a little off her rocker towards the end of it. And Glenn begins to explain that in theology, God chooses to speak through the dying and the insane. It seems to Glenn that there are good reasons for that. He says a madman or a person on her deathbed is a human being with a drastically changed psyche. A healthy person might be apt to filter the divine message, to alter it with his or her own personality. In other words, a healthy person might make a shitty prophet. And Glenn cannot help but admit that there are some perfectly sound psychological and sociological reasons for their walk. Why they have to walk instead of driving. Why they had to go without food or water with just the clothes on their backs. Glenn explains that there is essentially a purging process that happens when you push away the comforts of everyday life. When you cast away things, you're also casting away the self-related others that are symbolically related to those things, you start a cleaning out process. You begin to empty the vessel. A man pre-plague who loses his TV, he might read, go see friends, or play the stereo. He also misses the television. There's a hole in his life where it used to be. He feels disappointed that that part of his life that he was accustomed to has been poured out. It makes a bigger hole in his life if he watched a lot of TV, a smaller hole if he only used it a little bit, but something is gone. Now, take away all his books, all his friends, and his stereo. Also, remove all sustenance, except what he can glean along the way. It's an emptying out process and also a diminishing of the ego. Yourselves, gentlemen, they are turning into a window glass, or better yet, empty tumblers. Ralph doesn't know what the point of this is. Why go through all of that? And Glenn says if you read your Bible, you'll see that it was pretty traditional for these prophets to go out into the wilderness from time to time. Old Testament magical mystery tours. The time span given for these jaunts was usually 40 days and 40 nights. A Hebraic idiom that really means no one knows exactly how long he was gone, but it was quite a while. Does that remind you of anyone? Of course it does. Mother Abigail. So Glenn tells them to think of themselves as a battery. Everything you do, everything you think, it all has to run off the battery, like the accessories in a car. So TV, books, friends, food, it all runs off the battery of their mind. A normal life, at least in what used to be Western civilization, was like running a car with power windows, power brakes, power seats, all the goodies. But the more goodies you have, the less the battery can charge. But now, the four of them have stripped themselves of those accessories. They're on charge. And that makes Ralph uneasy because if you leave a battery on charge long enough, it explodes. Glenn points out that the human mind is a lot bigger than the biggest car battery. It can take a charge to infinity. Stu asks if they're changing. And Glenn thinks that they are. They've all dropped some weight. and physically. Despite the lack of food, they feel great, better than they have in years. Larry explains that it's also a state of mind because he's been feeling it for the last week or so, like he's high, except he doesn't get that disorienting feeling that comes with dope. He thinks just fine, better than fine, actually, but he still feels high and it feels good. But that may also be the hunger Glenn agrees, because when you empty out the vessel, you also empty out all the crap floating around in there. The additives, the impurities, sure it feels good. 
It's a whole body, whole mind enema. But will this help with flag? It might. This is what it's for. Emptying the vessel. Gaining strength. But they'll just have to wait and see. Larry asked Kojak if he knew he was a big old battery with a lifetime guarantee. Kojak didn't appear to know or care, but he wagged his tail to show he was on Larry's side. The next day, they come upon an overturned Ford wagon with four dead bodies, including two children. They find a bag of stale chips and some animal crackers. And they all chat amiably about animal crackers, and later they find a delivery truck with canned ham in the back. It wasn't really spoiled, but Stu still felt it tasted too rich, too meaty. Their stomachs had shrunk, so all they had was a piece or so before continuing on. They camped east of Green River that night, and in the morning there was a light dusting of snow. On the 23rd is when they came to the washout. The sky had been overcast, and it was cold enough to snow. The four of them stood on the edge, Kojak at Glen's heel looking down and across, Somewhere north of here, a dam might have given away, or there might have been a succession of hard summer rainstorms. Whatever, there had been a flash flood along the San Rafael, which was only a dry wash in some years. It has swept away a great 30-foot slab of I-70. The gully was about 50 feet deep. The bank's crumbly, rubbly soil and sedimentary rock. At the bottom was a sullen trickle of water. They looked out into the emptiness, which was now beginning to be dotted with strange wind-carved pillars and monoliths. About 100 yards down the course of the San Rafael, they saw a tangle of guardrails, cable, and large slabs of asphalt composition paving. One chunk stuck up toward the cloudy racing sky like an apocalyptic finger, complete with white, broken passing line. One by one, they made their way down the edge. Larry and Kojak seem to have no issues, of course, and they consider walking upstream to find a shallower bank to climb up, but there was always the risk of another flash flood, so they begin to climb up the other side. Larry first, then Glenn, who is a bit shaky on the incline, but manages to make it with some help from Larry. Ralph went next, climbing like a stolid mountain goat. When he reached the top, Stu began his ascent. Right up until the moment he fell, Stu was thinking that actually this slope was a little easier than the one they had descended. The holds were better, the gradient a tiny bit shallower, but the surface was a mixture of chalky soil and rock fragments that had been badly loosened by the wet weather. Stu sensed that it wanted to be evil, and he went up carefully. His chest was over the edge when the knob of outcropping his left foot was on suddenly disappeared. He felt himself begin to slide. Larry grabbed for his hand, but this time he missed his grip. Stu grabbed the outjutting edge of the turnpike, and it came off in his hands. He stared at it stupidly for a moment as the speed of his descent began to increase. He breaks his leg on the way down, in two places at least, maybe more, and his knee is shot. Larry hurries down the slope again and asks Stu how bad is it. He tells Larry that he figures he'll be walking again in, oh, three months or so. Ralph and Larry splint the leg, and Glenn gives Stu one of his arthritis pills. Whatever was in that pill certainly helped dull the pain, and Stu found himself feeling very calm and serene. It occurred to him that they were all living on borrowed time, not because they were on their way to find Flag, necessarily, but because they had survived Captain Tripp's in the first place. But Stu knows what has to be done. He needed to make sure that it got done. So he tells them, no rope, no car. They need to continue on to Vegas without him. This enrages Larry. If they leave Stu, he'll die. Stu says they're almost surely going to die over there, so they need to get moving. There's no need to waste the remaining daylight that they have. Larry refuses, leading he and Stu into an argument. Stu says that this whole trip is based on the idea that the old lady knew what she was talking about. If you start freaking around with that, you're putting everything on the line. And Ralph happens to agree with Stu, which, of course, irritates Larry further. And then Glenn speaks up. They are going to leave Stu behind. Larry thinks they're all crazy, but they made an agreement. 
They told Mother Abigail they would do what she asked them to do. It almost certainly means their deaths, and they know it. But they understood that when they agreed. Now they have to follow through. Larry keeps trying to find ways to take Stu with them. When Glenn grabs Larry's shirt, and he asks, Who are you trying to save? Stu or yourself? It's very simple. They have to continue. Stu cannot go. Larry is pale, and he cannot accept this. Ralph thinks that it might be a test, but Stu settles things for them. They put it to a vote, leaving it three to one against Larry. Stu has to stay. Larry keeps pushing, and he says that it's not Stu you're thinking of. You're trying to save something in yourself, I think. But this time it's right to go on, Larry. We have to. Larry suggests that they camp there tonight and figure it out in the morning, but Stu doesn't want them to do that. One night would turn into two and then three, and they were just wasting time. Glenn hands Stu his bottle of arthritis pills. He tells them that they have a morphine base, so three or four would probably be fatal. Stu understands. It takes Larry a moment to understand what was being said between them, what was being implied, and suddenly Larry sees pills and uppers and downers. He sees Rita in her sleeping bag, stiff with green puke coming out of her mouth. He tries to take the pills from Stu, but Ralph pulls him back. Stu tells Ralph to let Larry go so they can talk. He tells Larry that he's in charge now. He asks Larry if he thinks Stu is crazy, and Larry says, of course not. And Stu says he isn't crazy, and he can decide what's right for him. If they get out of Vegas, Stu tells Larry to come back his way. Men can go 70 days without food if he's got water. But Larry points out that winter will be there before then. He'll die of exposure in three days, even if he doesn't take the pills. But Stu says it's not up to Larry to decide that. Larry says, don't send me away, Stu. But Stu says, I'm sending you. It takes a few more pushes, but Larry finally agrees to do it Stu's way. God help their souls. The three men say goodbye to Stu, Ralph, and then Glenn. Glenn has been crying, and he tells Stu that it's been goddamn good to know him. Stu replies, don't say goodbye, Glenn. Make it so long. It's better luck. You'll probably get halfway up that frigging bank and fall down here, and we can spend the winter playing cribbage. But Glenn says that it's not so long. I feel that, don't you? And because he did, Stu turned his face back to look at Glenn. Yeah, I do, he said, and then smiled a little. But I will fear no evil, right? Right, <laughs> Glenn said. His voice dropped to a husky whisper. Pull the plug if you have to, Stuart. Don't screw around. Stu promises that he won't, and they say goodbye. Ralph and Glenn climb back up the gully. When they're up safely, Stu tells Larry that he is the one that has to make the decisions now. Larry feels like they'll get ambushed and killed, but Stu thinks that they'll be taken to flag. It'll happen in the next few days, and when he gets to Vegas, keep his eyes open. Just wait. It'll come. Stu doesn't know what it will be, but Larry has to be ready. Larry says that they'll be back for Stu if they can. Then Larry went back up the bank quickly and joined the other two. They stood and waved down. Stu raised his hand in return. They left. And they never saw Stu Redman again. So chapter 72 is a very emotional chapter for quite a few reasons. It starts out with some friendly camaraderie, friendly banter, playful jostling between the four men, and of course, Kojak. We find out that they've been gone 12 days, and they've walked over 300 miles, but they still have about 400 to go. When Stu asks if Glenn thinks Flag will take them, Glenn responds, I will fear no evil. This, of course, comes into play later with Stu's dream, and then when they say goodbye, it's something that the men will think to themselves at various times moving forward. And I really did enjoy the glimpses into these few days that they were together, whether they were talking about Glenn's thoughts on prophets and visions or animal crackers. It felt like the four men had become friends, at least better friends than they had been in the free zone. I think it was really important here that King shows their bonding. King shows what they mean to each other. He wants us to care about these four guys and their friendships. 
We needed to see why Mother Abigail picked these four men. And you know what? I do have to say that Glenn's theory on prophets was interesting. And I think King felt like he needed to explain why Mother Abigail would not only send these four particular men, but why she would send these men to walk 700 plus miles with no food or water when, like Larry said, they could have just driven and been there in a week. What they're doing, as Glenn puts it, has historical precedence. American tribes had visions, having visions, as part of their manhood right, going into the wilderness unarmed, waiting for a vision, which of course would come because (laughs) starvation is a great hallucinogenic. Mother Abigail might have sent them out there to have these visions, or maybe it was just to gain strength through the purging process. It was to empty the vessel of their impurities and their flaws and to make them, I don't know, pure in the eyes of God. Glenn uses pretty simple terms in order to explain it to Stu, Ralph, and Larry, although I think he was putting it in dummy terms (laughs) to explain it to the reader, (laughs) which I'm glad he did because sometimes that sociological stuff just flies right over my head. He uses television as an example, something, you know, something integral to a lot of us that he takes out of their life. A man feels that sense of loss, even if he has other ways to fill the void. So this also in 2020 makes me think of our cell phones. How many times, oh, I just bumped my microphone. I'm so sorry, you guys. How many times do you go out to your car or you're wandering through the house or you're in the shopping mall and you realize you don't, where's your phone? And you're panicked. You're trying to find your phone. You need your phone. Uh, When you leave the house and you realize you forgot your phone at home, it feels like you're missing something important. You're missing a limb almost. Um, Some people would turn around and go get their phone because they cannot go through the next several hours without it. And I kind of feel like that was sort of a very comparable comparison. I know comparable and comparison mean the same thing, but just kind of modernizing that whole feeling of being without something that's very integral and very important to you, even though it's not a necessity, you still feel that disappointment and that loss. Now, imagine how you're going to feel going many, many days phoneless, flushing that particular addiction because people are addicted to their phones. How do you think you would feel if you went 12 days or longer without your phone, without television, without a book, without your friends? I know oftentimes, at least in terms of social media, after I'm off of it for a couple of days, I feel much better mentally. So it's easy enough to understand Glenn's purging out theory. And I suppose sending the four men out into the quote unquote wilderness has made them healthier physically and mentally. It's a whole body enema, as Glenn so eloquently puts it. Will this make them stronger against Flag? Does this have some kind of significance to help them defeat him? No one knows for sure, but I mean, obviously it can't hurt. Maybe Mother Abigail knew that this is what they needed in order to write themselves for God and to confront Flag. We also get confirmation of two deaths that had happened in the earlier chapters. The kid, whom they had dubbed the Wolfman, Apparently, at some point, the kid had decided to make a run for it, of course, while Flag's wolves had waited patiently. One manages to tear out the kid's throat, but it seems like the kid was able to strangle the wolf before he died. This leaves a really gruesome but haunting imagery. And Larry seems to know instinctively that Flag might have sent these wolves to kill this man, just as he had killed Harold once he was done with him. They find Harold's corpse as well the day after coming across the kid. And not much is said of Harold's, what Harold wrote in his notebook, other than it was a pitiful dying declaration. Stu does feel anger over Harold's death because it was a waste, just as Susan and Nick's deaths were a waste. What was the point? Stu comes to the conclusion that he really does want to pay flag back for Harold as well as Nick and Sue. This shows a lot about Stu's character that he wants vengeance for his friends, but for Harold as well. Stu seems to recognize how Flag had used Harold and how, despite his pompous attitude and pretentiousness, Harold was vulnerable and easy to manipulate. To Flag, Harold was nothing more than a prop, a puppet tossed aside when he was no longer useful. 
Despite everything Harold had said and done to the people of the Free Zone, Stu pities him. I think he even mourns him in his own way. Stu wants the chance to choke Flag to death, but something inside of him is pretty sure that he'll never get that chance. This is, of course, a foreshadow. Maybe his gut seems to know something is coming, even if he doesn't consciously know it yet. So when they come to the washout, it is evident that this will be a rather dangerous trek. Not only getting down the gully, but getting back up on the other side. It's about 50 feet. They take turns um, descending and then ascending. And it does seem like Glenn might be the one to fall, given his age and his arthritis. And seeing the scene mostly from Stu's point of view as he watches Glenn. But then it's Stu who falls, breaking his leg in multiple places. This is where the chapter gets really rough because they all know that they have to leave Stu behind. Even Larry, who pushes back hard against the idea. But this wasn't all about Stu for Larry because it was about Larry too. Larry, who used to be very selfish, who would take without ever giving. But he says here that he's done leaving people behind. And I think that Larry and Stu have grown to become great friends. And Larry, like the others, they've already lost so many people. Ralph and Glenn don't want to leave Stu either, but they understand the agreement that they made, what they had promised Mother Abigail. They know that they cannot drive, and they can't carry him. They have to go on without Stu. I don't think this was an easy decision for any of them, not even Stu, despite how firm and steadfast he was in his decision. I don't know if maybe if he hadn't taken those painkillers, he would (laughs) maybe not be so calm about it, but he is. Glenn calls out Larry. Is Larry trying to save Stu, or is Larry trying to save himself? They all know what's ahead of them. Knowing Stu can't continue, is this Larry's chance to get out of what he promised Mother Abigail? Well, you know, Stu can't go, so none of us can. Larry could stay with Stu. He can live. Despite his character growth, Larry is trying to save something in himself here. Glenn is right. But, you know, I cannot blame him. I think there are plenty of people who would see this as an opportunity to avoid inevitable death at the hands of a madman. I don't believe that Larry's refusal to leave. Stu is all about him. It's not completely selfish, but there are some self-serving arguments in his desire to stay. And then, of course, there is the matter of Glenn giving Stu his pills. Obviously, Glenn is telling Stu that if it comes down to it, he can take the pills and overdose. Especially if Glenn and the others never make it back, what other option will Stu have? This is a rough choice to make, but Glenn cares enough about Stu to give him that choice. Glenn will continue on in pain without his pills, but he knows his pain is nothing compared to what Stu will go through alone. Starvation, dealing with the elements, what if a flash flood does come back through, wolves. He's saving Stu, in a sense, in his own way. And no, Larry doesn't like this option either because he's seen what an overdose does to a person. He had failed Rita, and she died, and now he feels like he's failing Stu as well, and that he will meet the same end. The scene here between Larry and Stu, where Stu tells Larry that he has to take charge now, he has to lead, it has such sadness to it. Larry has it in him to be a leader. We already saw that when he led his group, essentially from Maine to Stovington, you know, to eventually to the free zone. People saw Larry as their leader. And if Larry didn't have the capability to lead and make the decisions that needed to be made, Mother Abigail would not have sent him with Stu, Ralph, and Glenn. She knew Larry could handle this if any of them fell, especially if Stu fell. But Larry still shows that fear and vulnerability. In the end, he makes the right choice to go, even if he doesn't agree with it. It's that line, don't send me away, Stu. It almost feels like he's asking Stu... Please don't send me to die. Don't send me to flag. But he has to go, and they both know it. I think out of all of the four here, it's Glenn and Stu's friendship that is the strongest. Glenn was the first person Stu met when he escaped Stovington, and they've been through a lot together. And I think Stu has learned a lot from Glenn. Their goodbye for me was the most emotional one. And I think they both know that they're never going to see each other again. So Stu tells him, don't say goodbye. Just make it so long. But Glenn, being Glenn, 
He's a realist, and he responds that it's not so long. I feel that, don't you? And that really stings. I can't lie because not only do they know that this is really goodbye, but we know this is goodbye too. Because in true King fashion, he tells us, just as he did with Dana Jurgens, they never saw Stu Redman again. And I can't lie to you guys, I got a little weepy <laughs> rereading this chapter, especially that last line. It always gets to me. We know what happened to Dana, but we knew that she wouldn't make it back from how King had worded it. No one in the free zone ever saw Dana Jurgens again. And But this is they, Ralph, Glenn, and Larry. They never saw Stu Redman again. So this could mean one of two things. Stu dies or they die. We just don't know how it's going to happen yet. Mother Abigail's premonition had come true. One of them would fall before they made it to their destination. And who knew that she had meant it literally. (laughs) But you know what? Larry and the others continue on their journey. And next week, they make contact with those living in Vegas. In Chapter 73, Larry, Ralph, and Glenn will make their stand. We are finally there the confrontation between good and evil. So get ready because chapter 73 is not an easy one. So that was chapter 72. And I can't lie, like I'm still kind of, I've read this book so many times and this chapter always leaves me feeling despondent, (laughs) really sad. Um, I think because we've been on such a long journey with these four people that seeing them split up, seeing and knowing that they'll never see each other again, it's really hard. So yeah, I'm still feeling it. <laughs> but next week is going to be hard too. We're getting into the home stretch. And uh, I hope you guys hang in there with me. And that's it for this episode of The Circle Opens. If you guys are enjoying the podcast, Uh, It would be amazing if you left me a rating review on Apple Podcasts or just drop me a line uh, at thecirclecloses at gmail.com. You can also find me at thecircleopens.com. I am continually working on the site. I'm adding things. Um, Hopefully, it will have uh, a bunch of stuff for you guys to check out there soon. I'm also working on a very extensive timeline of the book, (laughs) so wish me luck on that. And if you want to follow me, I'm on social media at thecirclecloses. Nope circle opens. Uh, It would have been so much easier if the circle opens at gmail.com had been available. (laughs) I'd be less confused about what I'm telling you. So that's it, you guys. I hope you're staying safe, healthy. Um, It's almost October. I hope you guys are hanging in there. 2021 is just around the corner. Hopefully we get there in one piece. And uh, thank you guys for all your support and your listeners and all my listeners for reaching out to me as you have, I truly do appreciate every kind word. You guys really do make my day, so thank you. So, with that being said, you guys, M O O N, that spells see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>